Jesus made the promise to us that upon the truth that he is the Son of God, he would establish those whom he had called out. Matthew 16 is where he said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's a pretty tall order. He's promising that hell will not prevail against those who are foundationed upon the truth that he is the Son of God, the Christ, the Son of God. Now, let, let's clarify one thing here very quickly. There's the norm in which people think that, you see, the gates of hell are coming against us and the purpose of the church is to hold out until Jesus comes or until we go to heaven. That's rubbish. You know why? Because gates do not go after anybody. Gates are stationary. Gates are meant to protect that which lies behind the gates. Jesus clearly had in mind here the concept of an ancient city that had its battlements, its fortifications, and its gates. The gates of an ancient city were the weakest part of the city, the place where the city was vulnerable. I visited uh, Solomon's chariot city in Megiddo. It sits astride a, a hill along the path that invaders came from the north into Israel. The, it, the plains of Megiddo, famous for any number of battles and famous for one of the last great battles. Now, the, the walls of this, of this ruined city are still evident today. They're casemate walls over four feet thick and probably in those days 20 feet high or higher. It was impossible or nearly impossible for an attacking army to simply scale the walls and take the city. The gates of the city were its vulnerable points because, of course, the inhabitants of the city needed to get in and out as well. And the gates had to be such as would allow ingress and egress. Well, in this particular city, there was a six-chambered gate. You would go in, turn, go in, turn, and go in and turn. Three different turns. It was like a maze outside of the gate. Now, the reason that this was so is that an attacking army had to come in in single file. And the archers on the walls of the city were compelling the, the advancing army to come in in single file, and they'd pick them off as they would come in. So the gates of a city in ancient times were ways that the residents of the city, the defenders of the city, would entrap the attackers and make it a killing ground. Jesus was telling us that he has sufficient authority against the domain of hell so that whoever comes against hell in the name of Jesus Christ by his authority would overcome the killing ground, overcome the entrapment of hell and would, would rescue those who were in and behind the walls of hell in the domain of that city because they had come in the sufficiency of the authority and of power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is how it works. I mean, every person who is listening to this broadcast, who is saved, was at one time a citizen of the dark domain, a citizen of hell. You were rescued out of hell. 
it's not so much that people, are, when they die, they're going to hell. It's that they're already lost. And if you're not saved, your position never changes. How did you, if you're saved, how were you saved? The likelihood is that somebody who had the message of Jesus Christ came to you when you were lost, rescued you, brought you out of that condition through these chambers of the gates of hell and according to Paul in his letter to the Colossians, God translated you from the powers of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of God and there was not a thing that hell could do about it. You were rescued by someone who had the sufficient authority and power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ sent by the Lord Jesus to rescue you and the rescue was successful. And it has been successful for uncounted numbers of cases. Why? Because we have the authority of Jesus Christ. You see, this, this scripture from Matthew 16 that says, And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's true. That is true. It's factually true. And everyone who is saved in their lives, that scripture is true. Upon the truth that Jesus is the Lord and Christ, anyone who is captured by hell may be rescued. Upon that truth. Now, some have perverted this truth to say Peter is the foundation of the church. That's simply not true because this is an issue of authority. What was it that Peter had confessed? Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The same Peter, understanding that, in Acts 1, makes the statement that God raised Jesus from the dead and made him to be both Lord and Christ. That's Acts 2. Right? Now what does it mean for Jesus to be both Lord and Christ? What's the difference between being Lord and being Christ? Here, here Paul, uh, he says it this way. God has raised Jesus to life and we're all witnesses of this fact. And he set him at the right hand of the Father and he has received from the Father the promise of the Spirit which he has poured out. And so he was explaining to the audience on the day of Pentecost this. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus. This is verse 36 of Acts 2. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. Now what's the distinction between Lord and Christ? Well the word Christ is the word Mashiach in the Hebrew, Messiah in English, and it means the Anointed One. God has made him Lord and the Anointed One. Lord is the title Christ, the Anointed One, is the power by which the title has authority. There is, there is an, a, a, a power and then there is authority. Power is the ability to do a thing and authority is the right to do the thing. It's sort of the gun and the badge. A policeman has power because he carries around a gun strapped to his side or some weapon. But if he uses that power or that weapon outside of the scope of his authority to use it, he may be charged with criminal activity. But if he discharges that weapon or uses that force or power within the scope of the authority that he has been given by the state and by extension by the people, then because he has the requisite authority, he may properly use the power. Christ has the authority of lordship. 
Jesus has the authority of lordship. He is lord of lords. He is ruler. But he has the power that comes from being the Christ. God gave him the title of lordship, therefore the authority, and God gave him the power with which to act. So against his enemy, Jesus has all power and Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. Now why would the scriptures say that he has authority in heaven? Because Paul identifies the seat of that which opposes him as being in heaven. Here he says in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10, Finally be strong in the Lord, that is within the scope of the Lordship of Christ and in his mighty power. There you have it, power and authority. Put on the full armor of God so that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There it is. Verse 12. The seat of that which opposes us who are the called out, who are the body of Christ, who are the presence of Christ in the earth, endowed and clothed by the Spirit of God, that which opposes us is the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It is clearly the demonic. The demonic opposes us. That's who the enemy is. That's why our enemy is not flesh and blood. Our enemy is not one political party or another. Our enemy is not one political candidate or another. Our enemy is not one particular human being or another. It's when we get crossed up on these things, we lose our focus and we lose our way. So we, we take up battles against humans. We get into the battle against homosexuals. We get into the battle against abortionists. We get into the battle against this and the battle against that. The struggle is not against humans or what humans are thinking. The struggle is against the demons that put these ideas in humans. If we're going to win the battle, we cannot focus our effort upon the humans who are the unwilling or unwitting pawns, even if they're willing, in what is a spiritual struggle. This is a struggle against the enemy of God and man and us who are the people of God. And therefore the struggle is spiritual. What is the underlying root of the sin of abortion? It is spiritual. What is the underlying root of the sin of homosexuality? It is spiritual. What is the underlying root uh, uh, under every sin? It is how the enemy of God and man uses humans to wage war against God. That's the battle. If you miss that, how could we possibly hope to understand spiritual warfare? How could we possibly hope to exercise sufficient power in the realms of mankind against these things. This is where we've been misguided. People don't know what to do because they don't know what we're doing. They don't know what the theater of our conflict is. They don't know what the definitions of the conflict are. They don't understand what the war is about. The war is not against flesh and blood. The power that you have from Jesus Christ is meant to be sufficient for your warfare in rescuing people out of the domain of hell and bringing them into the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said he would do. He said, upon this truth that I am Lord and Christ, I will establish those whom I've called out because the gates of hell are, have people behind them and I'm sending you into hell itself into the authority and the domain of these principalities, these powers, these spiritual forces of evil to rescue the people whom they have entrapped by their various devious schemes. 
one of the series that I will be speaking in, 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 in the ensuing time is on the devil's schemes. It cannot be plainer than this. The church has lost its way because it simply does not understand even the most basic things about its existence. Why do you need power? You need power because you have a mission to go and rescue people who have been entrapped by the various lies and schemes of Satan since the days of Adam. Jesus came to undo the works of Satan, which is to bring light and hope to those who are in darkness. Is the enemy going to simply allow you to do this? No, he's going to oppose you every step of the way. If you try to do this, either in the power of your own doing or the power in all of the people who are gathered together with you to try to do this, if you try to do this in the power and support of a government, the, the crown, uh, the empire, the goodwill of a nation, what use is this power against the enemy? It is the power of the risen Christ who is Lord and Christ, power over the realms of the earth and power over the realms of the heavens. That's the power that has to be operating in you if you have any chance at all of fulfilling this destiny. That's what it's about. When I say that the church has lost its way, I'm not talking about the fact that it's thinking only in terms of building buildings and stacking up people. It's lost its understanding of its very purpose for being. And to come up with some new entertainment format to draw people into the meetings is about as pointless as anything else we're doing. So what if you did get a number of people more coming and observing the entertainment and getting all excited about that? Is that our purpose for being in the world? Is that the purpose for which Jesus has given authority? No. It is to rescue people out of the domain of hell. Not just to save them from it, but to allow them to fulfill the destiny of Christ himself living in them and Christ himself living through them. That's what the power of God is about. It's what the authority of Christ is meant to be. Absent that, everything else we're doing is a, is a meaningless charade. What are the people looking for when they leave the churches? What are they looking for? Why are they leaving the churches? They're leaving the churches because there's nothing in the church that has to do with their destiny. And they're leaving looking for why God put them here. I'm telling you why God put you here and by what authority and power you can go forward. That's what this is about. Jesus did not give us power to make us look good to our fellows. Whoever has that notion, whether they'll admit to it or it's just what they practice, has lost connection to the head and has no credible understanding of what the kingdom of God is about. The kingdom of God is about the power of Jesus Christ equipping those whom he has called out to function in not only resisting an enemy but rescuing those who are trapped by the enemy. And the whole world lies in that darkness. And it lies in that darkness until you come by the authority and power of the one who sent you. But when you come in that way by the authority and power of the one who sent you. you. When you come as the person of Jesus Christ in the flesh, because you are the body of Christ. That's the only biblical definition of the church. The church which is his body, the ecclesia, the called out, who are called to Christ and established on his authority, established in his power, to go against the enemy who has entrapped the interest of God, which interest is human beings. That's the simple story. Now, how much power does Jesus have to do this? All power. What authority does Jesus have to utilize that power? 
the authority of being made Lord and Christ. God himself recognized him as Lord. The Lord said to my Lord, David said, sit thou on my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord God Almighty made Jesus Lord of Lords, which means whatever he does is right. That's the foundation of his authority. He is Lord of Lords. That means he is enthroned in that authority. He sits upon the throne as the symbol of possessing that authority. The power by which he operates is the power of being the Christ, the Anointed One, God with man, God recognizing Jesus as being God, the Anointed One. Jesus is not, as some have said, one who possesses attributes of God. No, it's far more than that. Jesus is God. Jesus is the living God in nature and in kind. He is the child of the Holy Spirit. His nature is holy as God is holy. And the divine Godhead lived in him fully in bodily form. And whoever denies that God has come in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, that person is teaching under the inspiration of the spirit of Antichrist. Because that doctrine opposes the nature of who Christ is. When, as has been said, even on television, that Jesus is possessing of the attributes of God, but is not God himself in the flesh, that's the spirit of Antichrist. And it's a doctrine of demons. Jesus is the Christ, and because of that, he has power and he has authority, and he has all power in heaven and on earth, where the seat of the demonic is and where men are. The seat of the demonic is in heaven, but it operates in the earth. There are three heavens. The highest is the heavens of God, the second is the seat of the demonic, and the third, the earth where men are. The seat of the demonic is in the second heavens, and the seat of the power of man is the earth. Jesus has complete sovereignty, meaning power and authority in heaven and on earth. Now, but we know that he is enthroned in heaven. How does his power come to the earth where men are? And how is his power operating on the earth effective against the demonic in the heavenly realms? Now we need to discuss that, but it'll take more than a few minutes in which to do that. Therefore, I will devote the next program in this sequence to the discussion of the delegation of Jesus' power and authority. But to su summarize, Jesus possesses the entirety of power and authority, which is the right to do the thing and the ability to do the thing. God made him Lord, which conferred on him the right to do all that might be done, and God recognized him as Christ, which conferred on him the sovereignty of power to do it. Power is the ability to do it. Authority is the right to do it. And so Jesus has power and authority over the realms of man and over the realms of the demon. Therefore, his body in the earth is full of the power and the authority that he has been given. Now we, will, we need to look at how his power and how his authority are meant to function to rescue those who are in the control, in the clutches of hell. The promise to them is God has translated them or will translate them from the powers of darkness into the kingdom of his son, just like he did you if you're a believer, because the gates of hell cannot maintain their integrity against the coming of those who come by the power and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ to rescue those who have been caught in the deadly schemes of Satan. The Son of God was revealed for this reason, John tells us in 1 John, for this reason, to destroy the works of the devil. And he intends to do it through you, but we need to understand how. 
I'm Sam Solon. I hope you will join me as we continue this discussion. God bless you. And I'll see you then. Bye-bye. They are good for you, they are good for you. I know the place that I have. They are good for you, they are good for you. And no matter, child, what voices you were, just keep trusting in my unchanging Hello, I'm Sam Solon, and I'm the host of this television program. I'm happy that you've been joining us in the studies that we've been presenting via these programs. Now, many times I bring an entire series of messages, and you may be only able to hear one out of that series. If you're interested in the whole series, then we have them available for you. If you'll visit us on the website, www.solen, my last name, S O L E Y N, dot com, or visit us or write to us at the address shown on the screen. We'd be happy to hear from you. Also, of course, our intention is that these messages be available to the general viewing public without cost to the end user. Obviously, there are costs associated with the production and distribution of these messages. If you would like to help us do that, then we'd love to hear from you. We might suggest that you write to us at the address on the screen or visit us at the website www.solon.com. Our hope is that these messages will enrich the lives of those people who are seeking the Lord and we hope that you would join us in making this available. I'm Sam Solon. God bless you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.